Now, as we begin moving towards spring and the season of Lent, and, and yeah, we live in Georgia. We know spring starts in February. So I think they should change that, that little saying that goes April showers bring May flowers. Here it's pretty much February showers bring March flowers, and, and we're in this season. So as we move into spring, we're going to be looking at our faith, at Christianity, hopefully with new eyes, a new perspective, because whether we've been in this faith journey for a few months or 50 years, it's important to be open to rethinking, re-examining, exploring how we came to believe the things that we have believed, and maybe make some space for God to do some new things as we walk into the future together. And I really think this is what our story from Scripture today is all about. Because Jesus is turning everything they thought they knew upside down and inside out. And we don't want to miss it just because we've heard the story before. Now, I, the truth is, I think for all of us, that we remember things differently depending on what age we are, what we're focused on, what's important to us at that time. I remember this um, one movie that I really loved in college, and probably because it was about a group of kids who were deciding what they were going to do with their lives when they graduate from high school. I think it was called Breaking Away. One of the guys was a cyclist, and he wanted to go to Europe, so he was studying Italian, and he, he tried to speak with Italian accent everywhere he went. And it was, it was funny, and we thought it was a great movie. So, so when my in-laws were in town, we took them to see it. Well, it, it turns out that movie had a lot of expletives in it, words that I hadn't even noticed um, and didn't remember because I was so focused on the story and the characters. It just, they went right by me. And my mother-in-law is not a big fan of four-letter words. So <laughs> this time we sat through the movie cringing as she squirmed a little on the side. And uh, I remember those now. <laughs> But in life, like watching movies, we remember what we pay attention to, which depends on what is important to us at that time. And the Gospels are kind of like that. We have Jesus here teaching what sounds like the same lesson in two different versions of the story. When Matthew is telling the story of what he remembers about Jesus, well, he knows he's talking to a Jewish community. He really wants them to compare Jesus to Moses. He wants them to know that Jesus is even more important than Moses. So he's remembering Jesus on the mountain, and he's saying to his readers, you remember how Moses came down from the mountain holding those ten tablets with those command two tablets, ten commandments in his hands? Think about that. Picture that when we talk about Jesus giving this new set of instructions. But Luke remembers it differently. Maybe there were two separate incidents with the same lesson, but what we do know is that they remember what was important to them, how they understood Jesus, what he was trying to teach. And what Luke wants us to know is that Jesus was here for everybody, that God loves every person, and so should we. So when Jesus is giving this lesson on who is blessed, in Luke's version, he comes down from the mountain onto a level plain. He's right in the middle of the crowd looking at them eye to eye. And they've come down after a time of prayer and they've returned with the disciples. He comes down to a place that's accessible to lots of people, to many different people, people including foreigners from enemy territories, crowds of people who have been pushed out of their own homes, some marginalized and ignored because of diseases and unclean spirits. Renita Weems points out that there's even significance in the way that Jesus is addressing the crowd, because he's using the second person instead of the third. He's saying, blessed are you, not blessed are those who somewhere else. He's speaking intimately, compassionately to this crowd. They can see their pain and their struggles. He identifies with the crowd by standing with them rather than speaking down from above. 
We, the truth is, though, we, we kind of like the view from above. We like being up on a mountain, don't we? With a view from the mountain, we're, we're above it all. We're looking down on the world. The vistas are clear far from the madding crowd. In little ways, the story exposes our unconscious biases, how much of our perspective has been decided by our society and our culture. And that Im implicit bias is that there are those who are on top and there are those who it is acceptable to look down on, who are deemed as less. And there's a good chance the disciples were, were kind of thinking like we tend to think because we're told Jesus had to look up at his disciples as he started to teach like maybe they decided to hang back a little bit. Jesus walks right into this crowd of sick, unshowered, desperate, hungry people, and they're like, yeah, we'll stay up here on the side of the mountain for a little while. Don't worry, we've got your back. We're up here. But Jesus walks into the middle of the crowd, and he heals as many as he could for a while, and then he stops and begins to talk. Now, his words remind, of, remind us of what his mama taught him, because we have that earlier story from Luke where Mary sings a song about God's kingdom where the mighty, they might be on top now, but they will be brought low, and those who are pressed down will be lifted up, and the empty will be filled. He's heard that song before. This time, Jesus constructs four comparisons of blessings and woes, and they are the opposite of what people expect. He says, blessed are you who are poor, but woe to you who are rich. And blessed are you who are hungry, but woe to those who are full. And blessed to you who are weeping, and woe to those who are laughing Blessed are those who are rejected, but woe to those who are accepted. Now, we're tempted to spiritualize and personalize these words, but we just don't get to do it this time. Matthew softens it a little bit with blessed are the poor in spirit and the meek. And so maybe he's talking about us when we're being really humble. But Luke is very clear on this one. Andrew Pryor tells us that the words used here for poor is a person reduced to begging, someone destitute of all resources. Poor is someone who just cannot maintain their status and suffers a loss of honor as well as economic hardship. The ones who are treated as nobody. And Jesus is about to flip the tables on their long-held beliefs and turn them upside down. Blessed are the poor? What? For in the typical Greek understanding, the blessed ones are on a higher level than the rest of the people. They were humans who lived like gods. They were the wealthy, the upper crust, those who had many possessions. And now Jesus is using this word in a totally different way. It's not those elites with their mountaintop houses who are blessed. It's not the rich and the powerful who are blessed. Jesus pronounces God's blessing on the lowly and the poor and the hungry and those who are crying and hated by society. Well, throughout history, it had always been the other way around. It was those who were rich with a full stomachs. Jesus turns it upside down. For God notices the poor, values those who struggle through life, loves those who the world wants to pretend don't even exist. Gustavo Guterres explains this bias of God. God has a preferential love for the poor, not because they are necessarily better than others or morally or religiously better, but simply because they are living in an inhumane situation that is contrary to God's will. He explains that to be poor was to be cursed, to be invalid. A word that we still use for the sick, we just change the pronunciation a little bit. If a person who can't take care of themselves is an invalid, that's only a pronunciation change. But those who are with Jesus in this level place are the invalids, 
are the ones who were considered not good enough, not strong enough, the losers in the world. And this included people who were troubled with what they called unclean spirits, that description of what we now know is the scarring and trauma that comes from being human. Those intractable kind of illnesses, the PTSD, the anxiety, the things doctors can't identify with a particular part of the body that makes them so difficult to heal. But now, God's level place is the place which welcomes and values and honors all persons. Persons with mental illnesses and emotional traumas and chronic conditions. Blessed are those who have nowhere to go for they've lost their connections. And it's a hard passage to read because we have to ask ourselves, are we the poor in society? Are we those numbered among the rich. Even the word here that's used for rich is where we get the word plutocrat. We're not those. And some of us here may be feeling like we are always teetering between those two worlds, not knowing if next week we'll be out of a house or on the street or if we have more than we need next year. But we as Christians who listen to the words of Jesus we have a belief that we are heading towards something greater. We are heading towards a heavenly banquet where everyone has a place at the table. And here and now, whatever our social location may be, we are called to live into that vision. When we sing, Be Thou My Vision, are we living into the vision of God's kingdom where everyone is on a level playing field and everyone is beloved? Now, Paul Neutralin helps tries to help us understand what Jesus is getting at comparing Jesus' words maybe to our love of sports. Hey, two weeks in a row, I've got a sports illustration in here. Whew. I, sports are not necessarily my thing, but most of us have some sport that we enjoy watching, whether it's football, baseball, I don't know, extreme snowboarding. Anyone love synchronized swimming? Just thought I'd throw that out. But people love to keep score. Sports are all about keeping score and identifying who's the winner and who's the loser. And, and it's fun to watch if your team wins and by how many points they win and who finishes the season with the most wins or yards or touchdowns or whatever. But this passion for scorekeeping, which is a lot of fun when we're watching or playing sports, goes far beyond the games that we play. We love to keep score about everything in our lives. We tally who wears the best fashions. We keep track of who gets the best jobs or the nicest homes or seem to have the most successful children or who makes the most money. This is a belief system that exists on a global scale with multinational corporations and governments and this is where the poor and the hungry and the mournful and the despised that we see in this morning's story are the ones left out in the cold by all of the wheeling and the dealing of those world's wealthy, those who call the shots in the real life game playing. So maybe what we're hearing in Jesus' words this morning is not so much a reversal of fortunes in the human game that we're playing, who is rich and who is more, as much as it's a liberation from the game playing altogether. It's turning things upside down. Jesus warns the rich that our win-lose way of doing things ultimately ends up in lose-lose scenarios. One of Gandhi's favorite sayings was, an eye for an eye means the whole world will go blind. In other words, our tit-for-tat ways of evening scores eventually spire out of control to proportions when nobody can really be the winner. After two centuries of world wars and smaller wars, do we begin to understand with more than 50 million people dead, is anyone the winner? So maybe we can begin to see how 
Life changes if we drop the scorekeeping. It's fun in sports. It's dangerous in life. If in following the way where Jesus leads, we come to feel liberated from the games of comparing and clamoring for scarce resources. The words of Jesus can be frightening for those of us who know that we might fit into that next second category. But see, what we hear here is God is not promising that someday all the rich will get poor and all the poor will be insanely wealthy. God is promising a world where everyone is valued and cared for and provided a way to live with dignity, not better than others, but together in this vision of a beloved community. So maybe the question for us is really, which way of life do we really believe in? Do we say that we believe in the God of unconditional love, but we really believe in a world of keeping score? Albert Camus was an existentialist writer of the 20th century that you don't really expect to hear in a sermon, but he seemed to be contemplating our dilemma when he said, you are forgiven your happiness and your success only if you generously consent to share them. An interesting way to look at it. Do we believe in the love of God? Do we consent to share the blessing that we feel we have received. Sounds a lot like stuff that Jesus said. The level place is the place where God's vision of equality and compassion is in the process of coming true. And in this community, we pray every week, thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus calls us not just to give to charity, but to change the game, to level the playing field, to live as if we truly believe that God's beloved community is coming into being right here, right now, in our midst. Do we really believe it?